I want to, uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for being here tonight on this hot night, and uh, it's great to come all the way from New York to St. Louis for important discussions like we're having tonight, because these discussions about why we need a Labor Party have to take place everywhere. And I would say the first thing we'd want to do when we're trying to understand why we need a Labor Party and how to discuss this, we've got to try to understand these ideas so that we can convince our neighbors, we can convince our coworkers, we can convince our friends and our family, we can convince, uh, if we're students, convince other students at the universities. We have to convince everybody that there is an alternative, that life doesn't have to be the way it is, that we don't have to be pessimistic and cynical and that, and that uh, see, watch society go down the tubes, but we can actually see a much better society in the future, I believe, once, once the working class starts to struggle and once it has its own political party in order to uh, uh, tra transform society. So before I get into the reasons why I think we need a labor party, I'm going to start with a basic assumption. Because this, when we're discussing with our co-workers and our neighbors and our family, there's a certain basic assumption that's unsaid in this society that's preached every day by the media and it's preached by the educational system and it's, it's, and it's definitely preached by the political structure. And that is that do we live in a class society? Because there's a certain assumption about the propaganda from above that we live in a classless society, that we're all equal, that it's all one person, one vote in this country. But if you really think about it, and I don't think it takes much thought for average people to, to think about this and, and see, that in fact we live in a very much of a class society. It's not one person, one vote. It's maybe one dollar, one vote. Those who control the dollars really control the political system. When we talk about the Democrats and the Republicans, both of these parties are controlled by the wealthy. They both fundamentally represent the same class interests in society. They may play a slightly different role. It's kind of like um, the old uh, you know, police TV shows where, where they bring in the guy for questioning and they have a good cop and a bad cop, right? Now the good cop and the bad cop, they may act like they're opposed to each other, but in actual fact, they're working in tandem to get that person to break, right? To get that person to give up the interest. So, uh, to give up the information. So when we're looking at the Democrats and Republicans, let's understand them as a good cop and a bad cop. The Republican Party is openly the party of the of the wealthy and openly the party of, cap of capitalism. You know, like Romney, for example, he's a, he advertises himself as one of these uh, Wall Street financiers who actually went over, took over companies, stripped them of jobs, laid off people, busted unions, and then in some cases they drove people out. Of, you know, complete drove, drove the business completely out, out of business. They they made money because they took out enormous loans and then they used the money, they pocketed the money, and they turned it over and let the thing go to rot. Right. He he openly says that's who he is, that's what he believes in. So the Republican Party is that kind of party. Now the Democratic Party, they don't say that they're openly the, the party of the bosses, but in actual fact they are the party of the bosses. If we look at what they actually do, not just what they say, but actually what they do. The Democrats basically are the party that basically promises to be the party that's a friend of the working man, and a friend of the working woman, that's there to help people. Why did they actually, why did the Democratic Party actually get that kind of image? Actually, if you look at history, that image of the Democratic Party as friend of the working man so started in the 1930s in the Depression. Because at that time, the, uh, the economy was in such a mess, the capitalist slump was so bad, that the Democratic Party was, was forced to give certain reforms. Like they provided Social Security, they provided WPA jobs and, and some uh, the, the Tennessee Valley Authority. They pr provided some of these reforms. And as a result, they always tried to portray themselves as a party that's the friend of the working man. What you don't hear about that history, though, is what did it take to get the Democrats to give those reforms in the 1930s? In fact, there were mass movements in the 1930s, mass movements of the trade unions. The CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, was, it was a union that was set up in the early 1930s, and it swept uh, uh, it swept um, through industry in this country. It went from 1 million workers in 1934 to 5 million in 1940. And how did they build that union? Because they occupied plants, they took over the plants, they refused to work until they were organized, until they were recognized by the employer, and they had to fight against the National Guard, the police, the army, and everything in order to win those victories. But when you had those mass movements of the workers and a growing radical left in those days, you know in 1938 that the Communist Party in this country had 100,000 
members. A lot of people don't know that, right? A lot of people don't know the Communist Party was, was a, a very dominant force in the CIO. They controlled unions. Uh, their, their, their members were leaders of unions that led a million to two million workers at that time. So the power of that radical movement forced the Democratic Party to give some reforms. But of course, whatever they're forced to do, um, it, by expediency, they took credit for it and said, oh, look, we're the great party of the working, uh, the working man. Now, we saw this again in the 1960s. The Democrats put in a few reforms, right? They put in Medicare. Now, in Canada, they had Medicare, which meant free health care from everyone from the time you're conceived to the time you're dead. Everybody in Canada is covered by health care. Uh, but in the United States, they've only provided Medicare for people who are age 65 and above. So that's the only uh, reform that they gave. But the Democrats, when they gave that reform in the 1960s, once again, they didn't do it because they were the friend of the working people. They did it because there was a huge mass civil rights movement going on in this country. There was a huge mass movement uh, for black liberation in, in this country in the 1960s. There were, there were other movements. There were strike waves. There were, there were big battles against the Vietnam War. And all of this uh, instability, the political instability and social instability that came about at that time, forced the Democrats to try to give some reforms to get people calmed down and to get them back to work and to, and to get, keep the society uh, running very smoothly. So really, historically, the, the, the Democratic Party's uh, um, uh, 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 advertisement of the party of working people, it's very undeserved. It only was, it just happened to be the party that was in power during those mass social movements. So it had to provide a little bit of reform. So the question is, do we live in a class society? I think the answer is very clearly yes. Let me just give you some figures, if you don't uh, uh, believe me, but I bet everyone in this room would believe me. But we can use these figures when we're discussing with our coworkers. Now, the top 1% in this country, according to, this is in 2007, by the way, the top 1% in this country owned about 34.6% of the total wealth in this country. Now, in those figures, when they talk about total wealth, that's just, if you own your own home, they're counting that as total wealth, you know? So, so they're counting things like that in total wealth. But they say the top 1% of the population own 34.6% of the wealth. Just two years later, in 2009, the uh, top 1% uh, own 37.1% of the wealth. So just in two years, they already gained a greater share. But if we take out the family home, because when you own a home, you're not really using that as investment, right? If you buy a house to rent it out, then that's an investment. But if you buy a house to live there, it's not really an investment, it's not really wealth. So if you just look at financial wealth, like stocks, bonds, money that's in the bank, stuff like that, real financial wealth, you'll see that the figures are even more dramatic. Uh, the, the top 1%, uh, control, uh, 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 I'm sorry, yeah, the top 1% control 42.7% of the wealth of society, if it's just looking at financial wealth. The top 20% of society in terms of financial wealth control 93% of all the wealth in society, which means the bottom 80% of this society controls only 7% of the entire financial wealth in this country. Now, just common sense will tell you, when you look at that kind of financial distribution, you can say that, do we have the same interests as the people on the top who control and own all that wealth? I think not, right? So, and, and I think also we can answer this question whether we live in a class society every day when we go to work. Right? Who, whose interest is served at work and how is, how is each interest served at work? But it's always in the interest of the boss to make you work as hard as you can for as little as you can. That's what's in his interest. What's in our interest as workers? Our interest is to go to work and to be safe, right? To be working in safe conditions so we're not injured, so we don't lose an arm, we don't lose a finger, we don't lose a leg, right? Also, we want to work in decent conditions. We don't want to have to work to a point of ex complete exhaustion, but we want to have a, a, bit, a, a bit of a break here and there, and a lunch, etc. right? And, and also, it's in our interest to get a higher wage and higher benefits. But of course, when we get a higher wage and the higher benefits, from the point of view of the boss, that's coming out of his profits. But of course, his profits are made out of our, our, our labor, right? So that, that opposition, those that, that diametrically opposed opposition of the interest of the worker at the workplace and the boss, we can see that. And of course, it translates politically because if the wealthy use their money to uh, invest in politics, what are they looking for? They want to get political parties in power who are going to pass laws that serve their interests, right? They're, are they going to want to have laws that make it easy for unions to go on a strike? No. They're going to want to have laws that make it easy to get into a union? No. 
Do they like to cut uh, government spending and also cut the wages and benefits of the government workers? Yeah. Would they like to take the Social Security money and invest it in their stock market-owned companies? Yes. Or would they also like to cut Social Security so they don't have to pay so much taxes in it? Yes. It, we, we can just see what flows logically from the system is that we live in a class society and our classes are diametrically opposed. Therefore, the only conclusion we can, we can draw from that is that workers need their own political party. And we would argue that if the working class is going to build a political party, thank you, if the working class is going to build a political party in this country that, that is going to be anywhere successful, it needs to do it on the basis of the labor movement. Because the labor movement is the only uh, force in this society that has a lot of assets. Now, first of all, it does have some financial assets, but those financial assets cannot compare to the financial assets of the, of the rich and the ruling class. But they actually do have some financial assets. But in addition to that, what's most important is to have 13 million members around the country. And each of those members has family, friends, neighbors, and other people they can enlist in an army that can try to provide a political alternative. Not only that, the trade unions have offices and buildings all across the country that can be used for to mount political campaigns. New, uh, unions have newspapers, local papers, uh, newsletters, websites, all kinds of propaganda that, that could exist to give a working class perspective on the elections. So in order to build a labor party that has some uh, element of success, we're going to need either the entire labor movement or at least a giant chunk of the labor movement in order to be able to battle the big political parties and make a dent in society. Now, let's look at some of the reasons why we need a labor party. I'm just going to go through some of these because they come up in our discussions with our co-workers. And it also comes up if you bring it up, in, if, it, if you're a member of a union, you bring it up in your labor union, I, I guarantee you'll get a discussion with some of the union leaders about whether we need a labor party. And we want to have some arguments to be able to answer them uh, uh, on, on some of their arguments of, about why, why we should have a labor party versus building the Democratic Party. Now, first of all, the first point I would make is if you look at countries in this world that have mass labor parties, parties or have mass workers parties, what have those working workers have, have achieved versus what the working class has achieved in this country? Now, during the post-World War II period from the late 1940s to the 1970s, there was a huge economic boom for the United States and Europe and Japan. Now, during that period of time in the United States, during that period when capitalism was on an upswing, did we get universal health care in this country? No. Did we get Unpaid, did we get paid maternity leave in this country? No. Did we get free education on the college level? No. Did we get unemployment benefits that when you were unemployed, you could get 50, 60, and even 100% of your wages while you're on the dole, while you're unemployed? Did we get those benefits? No, we didn't. But if you look at countries that have mass labor parties, you look at Canada, which has a mass labor party, it's called the NDP. If you look at Britain, which had a labor, has a labor party. If you look at other countries that have like mass socialist and communist parties like France, in all those countries, people have paid vacation guaranteed by law. In France, you're going to, you, if you're in France, you're getting all of August off. You know, you get five, six weeks of paid vacation off every year, all the working class does in France. If you go to Canada, you have free national health care. Same thing in Britain. If you go to many of these countries like Sweden and the Netherlands, uh, you, you'll get paid maternity leave. You know, here, when, 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 you know, it was a great victory for some people when we got FMLA, the Fed, uh, the, which was allowed women to take three months off from work when they're having paid, but that's unpaid. But in some of these countries, you get paid uh, leave. And this is all because in those countries, because they had mass workers' parties and mass labor parties, it forced the ruling class to give more reforms. It forced the ruling class to make life better for the working class. Part of the reason they did that was to keep these parties out of government, or sometimes, in some cases, these parties captured government and put some of these reforms in. But that's one of the difference, uh, the difference between the United States and that. During our boom period, the United States, we never got those things. We never got universal health care. We never got free college education. We never got paid maternity leave and all that. And now, things have changed, as John was pointing out. We're no longer in a boom period. Since the 1970s, capitalism is in a period of decline. And even though productivity is greater now than it's ever been, you know, since the mid-1970s to the mid-2000s, uh, uh, productivity went up 94%, which means it almost doubled. That means your average worker in one hour produces double what they could produce at the beginning of that period in the mid-1970s. Mid uh, mid so even though people are working harder than ever, yet our wages are less, our benefits are less, and our living conditions are less. less. Just another statistic, if you look at real wages, the average non-supervisory worker earned more in 1973 in this country than in the year 2000. If you look at real dollars, 
because um, they, it, it went, if you look at real dollars, it's $746 a week in 1973 versus $612 in 2007. And actually, I'm sure the wages have gone down since 2007 because the slump that we've just had has, has allowed big business to use that as a pressure to knock wages down further because there's so many unemployed people. Now, what we need now, a mass labor party. What could a mass labor party do in this country? Uh, what, what, could, what could we